Hello and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. As I have said many times before, oscilloscopes are my favorite test tool. And as fantastic as they are, they are almost useless if you cannot get a probe where you need it. Most oscilloscopes come with passive probes that have two basic use models. And in many cases, these work just fine. But what about when you need to get into a tight space or you run out of hands? Needing a way to get in between boards led me to this post by Shabazz on the Element 14 community. These look exactly like what I had in mind. Those and these are resistive divider probes. So in this video, I use that guide to build some up, explain how they work, and show measurements where they work well and not so well. Heads up, this one does get technical quick. So if you have questions after watching, remember the best place to ask them is on the Element 14 community. There's a link below. With that, let's go build, talk, and measure. Before we get to how to build up the probes, let's take a look at their schematic. At the tip, there is a 950 ohm damping resistor connected to a coax that has a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, which then terminates into the oscilloscope's 50 ohm input. A small piece of wire connected to the coax shield provides the ground connection. For these resistive divider probes to work, you do need an oscilloscope with a 50 ohm input. Now, most low-end oscilloscopes only offer a one mega ohm input. There's two ways you can find out. Either look at the front of the scope or in the channel menu or in the data sheet. The two resistances creates a 20 to one divider with a loading impedance of 1000 ohms. To build up these probes, I used supplies that the Element 14 community sent me. The key is finding a suitable coax. I settled on this cable from Multicom Pro, which has SMA connectors on both sides. I need to use an SMA to BNC adapter to connect these to my oscilloscope. For the surface mount resistor, 950 ohms is a little bit harder to find, but 953 is readily available and close enough. Following Shabazz's example, I tried to solder the wires directly to the 0805 resistor. To make the joints a little stronger, I even tried using lead-free solder, which solidifies faster. However, even using this plastic stuff called poly dough, my tips would still break. Turns out my soldering skills are just not up to the task. And to prove it, here's one of my last attempts at the direct solder method. So I got to thinking, what could I possibly do? And that's when I thought of the high-end soldering probes that come with high bandwidth scopes. They usually have a small PCB. That led me to thinking about the proto boards that I had in my kit, and that got me really thinking. So I grabbed my Dremel, because rotary tools are super cool, and made some really small adapters. My plan was to solder all of the pieces to these PCBs. Turns out the 805 resistors fit nicely between 0.1 inch pads. For the cable, I stripped down the coax, tinned the shield, and added a ground wire. On the proto board, I placed a short measurement wire, and then I inserted the coax's signal wire. Instead of poly dough, I used heat shrink tubing and made sure that the measurement wire was accessible if I needed to replace it. If you make some of these, be careful when stripping the coax. On one of my builds, I had a strand of shield wire kind of touching the center conductor. It messed up the measurement. Who knew? In all, I built four variations of the probe, and for the most part, they all work pretty similar. Because of the additional PCB, we have broken the coupling between signal and ground, which means these may not perform as well as the ones that Shabazz built. Remember, unlike traditional passive probes, these resistive probes only have about one kilo ohm of DC loading. But like all probes, they become part of the circuit once you attach them. So next, let's look at how loading affects two different measurements. Whatever we connect these probes to need to be able to drive a few milliamps of current. In the case of a digital circuit, that should be no problem. Here I am attaching one of the probes to the I.O. pins of an Arduino Zero. This board has a 32-bit SAMD21 microcontroller, which has 3.3 volt I.O. pins. Looking at that pin on an oscilloscope, I was surprised to see how slow the edges were. To prove it isn't the soldering probe, let's compare it to a high bandwidth active probe. Active probes have a high resistive load with a fraction of the capacitive loading when compared to a passive. By the way, the one mega ohm listed here is the impedance at its probe tip. It still uses the oscilloscope's high bandwidth 50 ohm input path. Long story short, this probe gives the best representation of a signal, at least in this case. Let's save its waveform so that we can compare it to the solderin probe. Once saved, white is the active probe and green is the solderin. Two things to notice, the solderin's amplitude is slightly lower and there is a reflection in the edge, but overall its rise time is pretty close to the active probe. And we can probably tweak the custom divider ratio to fix the amplitude. 
That got me to be curious. What would happen with an even faster edge? This board has a Raspberry Pi RP2040 microcontroller, which have configurable rise time outputs. So in code, I set it to the fastest mode and then slowly toggled a pin. First, using the active probe, I measured the signal at the pin of another device because the RP2040's pitch is a bit tight. On the scope, we can see that the rise time is about 620 picoseconds. Then I soldered in one of the soldering probes at the same point. By the way, I really love that these free up my hands. And now we measure 450 picoseconds. At first, you might think, wow, this cheap probe is showing the edge to be so much faster. It must be better. Well, if we compare the two edges, you'll see the soldering probe has a little more peaking. The undamped wire is causing a little more ringing, so the edge appears to be faster than it is. But for a few dollars in parts, that is working really well. So what if, instead of building up a probe like this, we just clip a passive probe to a piece of wire? Which is what I did here. I replaced the probe with a wire. Then I clipped the probe's ground lead to a ground point and the probe to the wire. And now what we see is a mess. The edge is way slower. And check this out. If I change the code to toggle much faster, then compare the solder in to passive, you can really tell how the passive is attenuating the signal. To be fair, by using the wire like we are here, we have created a huge ground loop, which means overall, we're just not getting anywhere near the same bandwidth from this probe setup. So in this case, the soldering probe has a few advantages. First, mechanically, it is much easier to get it into places that even a passive probe might not be able to get to. And second, while it isn't as good as an active probe's signal integrity, it is much cheaper and provides more bandwidth than a 10 to 1 passive. That said, it will not work this well in all cases. FYI, for all of these measurements, I've been switching between the various probes that I had built because they all work pretty similar to each other. Now, remember, we are presenting a one kilo ohm load to the circuit under test. As a counterexample to the previous measurement, let's look at the crystal oscillator. At first, the scope displays a nice waveform, but whoops, the scope's default one mega ohm is still selected. When switching the channel's input to the 50 ohm path, the board suddenly disappears from the PC's device manager. So what's going on? Well, on the Arduino Uno, there is a 16U2 microcontroller acting as the USB to serial converter. It uses a crystal to have stable USB communication. With about one mega ohm of impedance, the oscillator circuit continues to work fine. However, when the probe dropped to the relatively low impedance of 1000 ohms, the crystal signal gets destroyed, causing the 16U2 to stop working. So then why not just use the one mega ohm mode all the time? Well, in that case, you now get the capacitive load of the scope's front end, and the bandwidth is lower than the 50 ohm path, so you might as well just use a traditional passive probe at that point. But this measurement illustrates an issue with all oscilloscope probes. Not all probes are ideal for all measurements. In a case where you have a very sensitive circuit like an oscillator amplifier, you usually want an active probe. But in many cases, especially digital signals, this soldering probe works pretty well. Again, are these probes perfect for every application? No, but in cases where you have a strong driver and need a hands-off measurement, they work great. Before I close, I need to extend a huge thank you to Shabazz for the excellent tutorial on the Element 14 community. Below, there is a link to it and the supplies I use to build my versions of the DIY soldering probes. Remember, that is the best place to ask me questions because I am more likely to see and then answer them over there. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to attenuated waveform reproduction on my electronics workbench.